Hi, I'm Jean Mulcahy-Levy. I'm one of the pediatric neuro-oncologists at Children's Hospital Colorado and an associate professor at the University of Colorado Anschutz campus. We're here today to talk about an aggressive pediatric brain tumor called ATRT. So a typical teratoid rhabdoid tumor, or ATRT, is an aggressive brain tumor of childhood. Under a microscope, it looks like a collection of small, round, blue cells that is similar to another tumor called medulloblastoma. But ATRT has a unique genetic change. These tumors have lost the function of a protein called SMARC-B1. It's also possible to see this under a microscope using a special stain called INI1. Here you can see the brown areas of INI1 staining, which highlights the blood vessels that have normal SMARC-B1. This is surrounded by the tumor cells that have lost that signal. In recent years, studies have also shown that ATRT can be separated into three subgroups. Group 1, orisonic hedgehog, group 2A, tyrosine, and group 2B, MYC. Each group has a set of different locations, aged diagnosis, and most importantly, different genetic changes in the SMARC-B1 gene. These differences suggest how these tumors develop, how there may be specific treatment options for specific groups, and research into this area is ongoing. Currently though, all ATRT are treated the same. We can use the different subgroups in combination with the age at which a patient is diagnosed to help determine the overall risk of the tumor. Being older at diagnosis is better, with children diagnosed over the age of one and in the tyrosine subgroup considered standard risk and having the best five-year overall survival estimated up to 72%. The patients diagnosed at less than one year, but also in the tyrosine subgroup, are considered in immediate risk, along with those diagnosed over the age of one, but not in the tyrosine group. The overall survival at five years drops off dramatically for the intermediate group, to approximately 33%. And finally, the highest risk population are those diagnosed under the age of one and not in the tyrosine subgroup with an estimated five-year overall survival of zero. As I mentioned, all ATRT have a genetic change in SMARC-V1. This protein is a member of a larger protein group called the switch sucrose non-fermentable or SWE-SNF complex. This protein works with things called enhancers in the genome. Typical enhancers have signals that will pull a small number of SWE-SNF protein complexes to their location and help turn on a gene. There are also things called super enhancers that have a much stronger signal and will bring many SWE-SNF protein complexes to their location for a much stronger signal to turn on a specific gene. In a normal cell, typical enhancers and super enhancers work together to balance how much a cell grows and differentiates into a specific cell type. When there is a change in SMARC-V1, the SWE-SNF complex cannot work correctly. It doesn't turn off completely, but by only partially working, the genes with super enhancers continue to have some function, while those with typical enhancers are no longer working. In the case of ATRT, this creates cells that are still given the signal to grow, but lose the signal to differentiate, which creates fast-growing, immature cells. Although we use some of our most intensive chemotherapy, survival outcomes of ATRT are still unacceptable, and new, hopefully less toxic therapies are needed. To investigate this, our labs performed a CRISPR genetic screen of potentially targetable genes. In this study, we found that if you block a gene for CDK7, the tumor cells were not able to survive. CDK7 is an important protein in cells that helps control the cell cycle and tell the cell when it should grow and divide. It also controls a pause mechanism on transcription or the process of making copies of DNA messages. When CDK7 is working, it releases the pause, which allows other proteins such as POL2 to create copies of DNA messages. In ATRT cells, it seems they are particularly sensitive to whether or not CDK7 is working. ATRT is not the only tumor where CDK7 seems to be important. Work in Dr. Rajiv Vibakar's lab has shown that CDK7 is important in medulloblastoma, and blocking CDK7, or putting the pause back on the cell, enhances the benefits of radiation in these tumors. In this case, blocking CDK7 prevents the cell from repairing DNA damage, leading to cell death. In ATRT, preliminary data suggests that blocking CDK7 can activate the SWE-SNF complex through a different protein called SMARC-A4 and inhibit P53 
PRC2, a partner protein of the Suisse-NIF complex. Working together, these proteins look to suppress tumor cell growth. You might think that a protein that is important in a vital cell process such as cell cycle would be dangerous to target in a person. In reality, it is possible to block CDK7 because the amount of CDK7 in ATRC cells is higher than that in normal brain. In fact, it's higher than that even in other aggressive tumors such as medulloblastoma and glioblastoma. All of the subgroups of ATRT have an increased amount of CDK7, with it being slightly higher in the tyrosine subgroup. Drugs that target CDK7 have been developed, which is allowing us to see how well blocking this protein might help prevent tumor growth. If we test a number of different tumor cell lines, we can see that as we increase the dose of a CDK7 inhibitor, the cells are less able to survive. If we look at the tumor cells compared to non-cancerous cells, both NHA or normal human astrocytes, or the NIH3T3 cells, you can see that the normal cells require significantly more drug to kill at least half the cells than any of the ATRT cell lines. We are able to show that CDK7 inhibition also works in vivo in our mouse models. Here we have measured how much a tumor implanted in a mouse brain would grow with either no treatment, NT, or with genetically blocking CDK7, where you can see the blue dots. It is clear that after only three weeks that CDK7 inhibited cells grew much less than those with a normal CDK7. One thing that we know in cancer is that it is not often that a single drug will be enough. As we saw in the previous slide, although the cells with CDK7 inhibition grew less, they were still able to grow at least a little bit. To find the right drug combination, we completed a drug screen and found a class of drugs called antimetabolites work together with CDK7 inhibition to decrease survival of the tumor cells better than all other drugs we tested. This is particularly exciting as antimetabolites, specifically methotrexate, is already part of our currently standard therapy for ATRT. Here you can see that if we treat with small doses of a CDK7 inhibitor or a small dose of methotrexate, there is a small decrease in cell growth. But when you put the two small doses together, you get a synergistic response with a dramatic drop in tumor cell survival. So where do we go from here? I bring this picture back up to point out something I skipped before, specifically that there are drugs, such as the one noted here, called samarocyclib, that inhibit CDK7. Some of these drugs are already in clinical trials in humans, and samarocyclib has already been shown to be safe in adults and can be given as an oral medication. As we continue our work in ATRT, we will be primed for a rapid translation into children with the disease, building on the success of the adult studies. This work could not be completed without the talented people who work in my lab, with the bulk of the work shown today completed by Andrew, Maddie, and Kendra. But an even larger group supports the success of this work through the entire Morgan Adams Foundation Pediatric Brain Tumor Research Program and the support of our grant funding, including the Morgan Adams Foundation, Team Connor, the Peter Barton Family Fund, and our newest support from the Hyundai Hope on Wheels Scholar Program. Thank you for listening today, and if you have any questions about ATRT or any other brain tumors, please don't hesitate to contact us.